Hey there, and welcome to AP Psychology. If you are just joining me on this channel, you are probably just starting your new AP Psychology class as a new student to that course, right? So I'm so excited that you're here. Make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel because I'll be updating my videos and plugging them in right here in this channel and you'll be notified as soon as I do that. Now, I wanna show you something and that is the accompanying notes that go along with this. Hopefully your teacher has provided that for you, um, but if you are, are a teacher or just want to check this out over on my teachers pay teachers store these are the notes that go along with it and they are locked up with each and every video that I have I make those for each and every one of the units so I won't bore you with that information but be sure to check it out I'll put a link for you in the description of this video and let's go ahead and get started So in this video, it really is an introduction to psychology and really the history of psychology because it used to not even be a thing, right? Like psychology used to not even be a science. And so that's really what we're gonna talk about in our first set of notes here. These are the learning targets that I will let you go over, but these are straight from College Board. So especially if you're a student taking this course, this stuff is really um, important for you and you'll wanna make sure that you are really hitting these points when you're going over this stuff in the video and in class when when you're working with this information so the first thing we'll talk about here is really pre-scientific psychology and like I was saying it didn't used to be a science and so we need to talk about kind of the philosophical side of things and how really in human history we came to what the subject is now is psychology so what is the relation of the mind to the body was really like those first early philosophical questions and we'll go through this stuff quickly because to be honest with you it's kind of boring right so the mind and body are connected with something that the hebrews aristotle and augustine those philosophical contributors right believed that the mind and body are connected are one entity whereas socrates pluto and descartes believe that the mind and the body are two distinct things. And that got us to this idea or this question of how ideas are formed and that we know that we are different as humans from other species. So what makes us different? Well, probably the fact that we can create things, that we have ideas, and it seems that our brain creates those ideas. Well, Socrates and Plato says that some of those ideas are inborn. We innately have ideas, whereas Aristotle and John Locke say that the mind is a blank slate. There's nothing, meaning that we are completely impressionable by our environment. So I want to go through a big um, a few big names for you here. The first one being Dorothy Dix. So she was considered the first advocate for those suffering with mental illness, insisting that they get help and not be tortured. And there's a little historical information for you in that mental illness, those suffering with mental illness used to be seen as possessed, right? By demons and like exorcisms were performed, bleeding out, all kinds of different tortures um, because they, these people were not seen as ill. They were seen as possessed or quote crazy, right? And just labeling someone that way makes them it takes away empathy, really, and takes away the approach that you want to help this person. And Dorothy Dix was one of the first people to advocate for them. She created the first mental asylum during the American Civil War. Now, structuralism, which brings us another name, but structuralism is a huge kind of foundational um, school of psychology or school of thought. Wilhelm Wundt um, was the father, considered the father of psychology, and established the first formal psychological laboratory in 1879 in Germany. And that's what makes him the father. And he kind of um, adopted or really created this structuralism. The goal of structuralism and of uh, Wundt was to study consciousness which is kind of a new thing at the time, how the elements of the mind were organized and related to one another. And he used something called introspection. Introspection is simply just looking inward, 
considering one's own decisions and thinking and really reflecting on this. And what's funny is I think the modern day term or buzzword or like trendy term right now for this is mindset. What is your mindset? How are you considering things? How are you making decisions and thinking about something? And how can you change that to approach the situation better? That's really what mindset is, right? Functionalism is another school of thought in psychology. William James was considered the first American psychologist, and he actually criticized Wundt for ideas being too narrow and boring. <laughs> Good criticism, right? <laughs> um, he was influenced by Darwin. Hopefully you understand who Charles Darwin was. But he was interested in understanding how consciousness, those thoughts and feelings, function to help people adapt to their environment, right? So what are their functions? Hence, functionalism. He also used that introspection, but he really wanted to look through, look at behavior and thoughts through questionnaires and mental tests, not just self-reported thinking. Gestalt is another big one that we will actually talk about in a couple units when we talk about sensation and perception, but it's important to have some basics here. It was founded in kind of a revolt against Wundt and his ideals around structuralism. Um, those of Gestalt psychology believe that consciousness was best understood, and this is really the key here, you want to make sure you highlight or underline this, by observing the whole experience rather than trying to break it down into a cluster of component elements. And that catchphrase, which is going to be really important, like I said in a couple of units, is the whole is greater or different than the sum of its parts. Max Wertheimer is the founder of Gestalt Psychology. So that's another name that you want to know um, in, this, in this first unit. All right, psychoanalysis is a big one. Um, and Sigmund Freud is like the bobblehead of psychology, right? Um, and he is, was the first psychoanalytist is psychoanalytist am i saying that right something like that so he was the first to focus on abnormal behavior and believe that behavior and mental processes are directed by you want to underline and highlight this unconscious forces and that really is the buzzword of psychoanalysis and what comes later in history psychodynamic perspective which we'll talk about in a little bit the unconscious mind problems arise from unresolved conflict in that con unconscious mind. So when we have junk going on in our life, a lot of times we call that baggage, right? We all have baggage from our past and traumatic things that have happened, no matter how small or how large they are, it's all relative. Um, it's suppressed, you could say, into our unconscious mind. When we don't resolve those issues, it comes out in what, he, what Sigmund Freud would deem as mental illness or it, mental health issues. He used free association and dream analysis to really dive deep into and understand and explore what was in the unconscious mind. Um, ideas really are still very controversial from this perspective or school of thought, um, but have had great influence on the field of psychology. They really have because it was the first he was really the first one to look at abnormal behavior, Freud was. So let's talk about that free association word really quickly. If I say the word yellow, what comes to your mind? And you should hopefully just blurt something out or write it down. You just experience free association. That's all it is. You don't censor what it is that you think or say. You just say whatever it is that comes to mind when the psychoanalyst says something to you in this instance. So it's on the slide here again, saying whatever comes to mind without censorship. All right, behaviorism is another huge school of thought with B.F. Skinner and J.B. Watson. We're going to talk about both of them more in the learning unit. But this school of thought became very popular in the 20s through the 60s. They disagreed with practically everyone in the field. Like they said, introspection, schminge, prospection. <laughs> like they thought it was a joke. Like that's dumb. Believe that psychology should only study what could be observed and measured objectively. That came straight from Watson. Only observable information, which is behavior. You can't observe thoughts. You can't. You can only observe behavior. They also insisted that solely, only external factors shape behaviors. And this was a thought from Skinner with his operant conditioning, which we'll talk about in learning, that thoughts and, quote, hidden parts of the mind are not relevant because 
they're nothing. That he says we're a blank slate and everything that is in our mind comes from the outside, comes from external existence or factors that shape our behavior. Now, let's talk more contemporary psychology. So structuralism, functionalism, psychoanalysis, behaviorism is all kind of old stuff. Not that we don't see some remnants of it still, especially psychoanalysis and behaviorism, but let's talk more contemporary and what's used today. So we define psychology today as the scientific study of behavior, what we do, and mental processes, those inner thoughts and feelings. And there's some controversy over whether human traits and behaviors are based on biology, which is that nature, or one's environment and experiences, which is nurture. And this really is the biggest debate, really you could argue ever, (laughs) um, but especially in the realm of psychology, is nature, one's biology, one's genetic makeup, and nurture, which is one's environment and experiences. So it's like DNA versus how you're raised, essentially. Now, it's important for us to understand the biopsychosocial approach in psychology and how all three of these things kind of go into a funnel, essentially, and out comes our behavior or mental process. And that approach really is a well-rounded one because you're considering the psychological influences, biological and social cultural. So biological being that genetic predisposition or even mutations, the natural selection of adapt, adaptive physiology and behaviors, and really the genes that we have. It's all genetics. That's what biology is. Whereas psychological are those learned fears and expectations, our emotional processes and cognitive processes and interpretations, social cultural is pretty self-explanatory, right? The presence of other people, cultural, societal, family expectations, peer and other group influences and compelling models, especially through media. Now, if you are distracted right now, I want you to make sure you come on back to me because these current perspectives are ones that are going to follow you through the remainder of this course, all the way through unit 14 if your teacher's doing it the old way or unit nine if your teacher's doing it the new way, right? I just wanna make sure we're including everybody here. The perspectives are everything and I'm, I'm hoping that you're then going to go over what are the buzzwords of each of these. I'm going to talk about these quickly, but I encourage you to pause, get this stuff written down and make sure that you've written down what these buzzwords are. So let's take them one by one. Biological perspective or neuroscience. It's where they're very much trying to understand how the brain and body physically underline and highlight that physically create thoughts, emotion, memories, etc. How is it created physically, anatomically in the brain, right? So they're very much looking at anatomy, physiology, or the physical aspects of what's being created, hence neuroscience. So how are messages transmitted throughout the body? How is blood chemistry linked with motives? Buzzwords here being anatomy and physical, anything physical. So you could say blood, neurotransmitters, neurons, um, the brain, any parts of the brain, any of that stuff. Evolutionary, which we'll talk about a lot in the motivation emotion unit, how natural selection process has caused our genes to develop and adapt and how that appears is in behavior. So how does that then influence our behavior tendencies? Behavior genetics is a big one we'll look at in development, which is how much our genes and our environment influence individual behavior. Um, So behavior genetics is really looking at both the environment and genetics. Um, So to what extent does our genes and environment impact really everything? I want to back up for a second, evolution, those buzzwords being natural selection, reproductive success, um, spreading your gene pool would be a big one. Behavior genetics is really just behavior or environment and genes and how genes predispose you to act a certain way in your environment. Psychodynamic is the new psychoanalysis. So you want to make sure that you write that down. New psychoanalysis. They emphasize the unconscious mind and that really is the buzzword. That is the buzzword of psychodynamic. Childhood trauma may be one as well, but that one could be tricky with behaviorism. So just be warned there. But how it directs all behavior and how does the energy from the unconscious motivate our actions. Behavioral is how our behavior is shaped by learning processes. And that is the buzzword, learning. 
of behaviorism is all about learning. So how do we learn to fear things um, and how can we change those problematic behaviors? Cognitive. When you think cognitive, think thinking. That's what I tell my students all the time. Cognitive thinking, thinking cognitive. That's the buzzword of cognitive and any synonyms that go along with that. Interpretations, um, rationalizations, those kinds of things. So how we take in, store, retrieve info and how our perceptions influence our actions. So it's really about how we're remembering, how we're using information and how we interpret information, how that impacts our behavior. Humanistic. These guys are like the hippies of psychology and that they believe everyone has potential to fulfill their greatest potential. Everyone has free will um, and that we're all striving for self-actualization. If you didn't get all that, rewind it and listen to it again because I said free will, full potential, and self-actualization. Those are three buzzwords. Um, really anything that has anything to do with the self, self-esteem, self-worth, self anything, um, all has to do with humanism. So they emphasize human growth and potential as well as self-concept. So how can I make myself a better person? And we'll talk about that more. Social, cultural, that really just being the buzzwords, essentially, but they're looking at groups. So like how family influences you, how your peer group, your neighborhood, that kind of thing. So human behavior must be interpreted in proper social and cultural context. So they'll be looking at demographics like racial and ethnic groups, socioeconomic groups. So how are va various ethnic groups alike different and how does that influence individuals, right? Um, and different across cultures, of course. Okay, so that was super fast. But now let's shift into the domains. First, I want to bring your attention to what's above this chart here. And that basic research is essentially the experimental domain. And that these domains, we're going to look at basic research and applied research. Basic research is, um, well, basic and applied research are both essentially like themes of what you would do if you got a degree of some sort in psychology. So if you're going to go into a career that involves psychology, you're either going to choose applied or basic for the most part, but something within each of those domains. So the basic research is I am going into psychology to do research so that other people can use that research to benefit human beings. So if you're someone who's going to go into the biological, cognitive, social, psychometric domain, you're just doing the research. Now, biological is pretty self-explanatory, all about the mind and the body and physical stuff. Developmental is looking at stages over the lifespan. Cognitive is perception, how we perceive, think, and solve problems. Personality is investigating persistent traits, right? Like there's, very, uh, there's a lot of nature versus nurture in that as well. Social being explores many ways in which people influence one another, those socioeconomic groups, ethnic groups, all that stuff. Psychometric is an interesting one. They're concerned with the theory and technique of psychological measurement. So anything that has anything to do with testing, whether or not it's psychologically involved. So it could be like the psychometrics of statistics or I don't know, meiosis. I don't <laughs> mitosis or something, right? Um, they are going to be involved in testing of that information and therefore that's psychometrics. Now applied research are the folks that take the research, read it over really heavily, consume that information, that research, and then use it to help people, right? They apply it to life essentially in other people's lives. So industrial organization is a big one. Um, it seems pretty cool too. They study and advise on behavior in the workplace. So optimizing um, employees or um, work ethic in the workplace um, and production manufacture in the workplace, that kind of thing. Educational is all about solving problems, having expertise in teaching and learning. Um, counseling, meaning helping people cope with academic, vocational, marital challenges and that they are counseling people through those challenges. Clinical is where they study, assess, and treat people with psychological disorders. Now, it might be easy to confuse counseling and clinical, right? So just make sure you're really delineating those and that clinical is with disordered behavior, whereas counseling is like seeing someone through trauma or through like a marital challenge or something like that. 
And then positive psychology is kind of newer in the last decade or two, where they emphasize and focus on positive events and influences in life and how simply wearing a smile, even if it's fake, impacts your mindset, right, to be more positive. Now, clinical psychology versus psychology is a really important understanding you have to have in that you could go to college to be a psychologist and you could have two very different routes. If you are going to be a clinical psychologist, you have a doctorate degree, a philosophical doctorate degree, a PhD, which means you study, assess, and treat troubled people with psychotherapy, which is essentially talk therapy. Whereas a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So they probably go to school just as long. It just looks very different and they're able to do very different things. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor. So think of someone wearing the white coat and a stethoscope, kind of like that. But they use the treatments like drugs, medications, and psychotherapy to treat psychologically diseased patients. So only a psychiatrist can prescribe medication, not a psychologist. All right, a huge organization you need to know about in our intro to psychology here is the American Psychological Association or the APA. They are the scientific and professional organization of psychologists and psychiatrists, right? Like everybody is involved there. It was founded in 1892 at Clark University. And then here's a few names you're going to want to know. Mary Winton Calkins was the first female president. And G. Stanley Hall was the first president ever of the APA and the first to earn a PhD in psychology. Margaret Floyd Washburn was the first female then to earn a PhD in psychology. All right, guys, so that was super fast, but really the important things are the perspectives, knowing those domains and names. Names are big from these. Okay, guys, so go ahead and make sure you subscribe to this channel so you can catch the next video that I'll have ready for you and catch those notes on my Teachers Pay Teachers store. Until next time.